everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan coming to you today live from Balconies, and I'm going to teach you how bourbon is made. Now, since 1964, we've had a legal definition of bourbon, and it is a distinctly American product. But a lot of people don't understand how it is made. And so we're going to go through the distillery, and I'm going to show you each step very quickly. And when we get done, you're going to have a full understanding of the process. Every bourbon starts off with grain, and that's why we're standing in front of these grain silos. And grain will come in here in these giant trucks, and they have a system that they will kind of pump it up in the top of these silos, and they have another system for moving the grain around the distillery. But before they start messing with the grain, it has to be tested because grain can actually be infected with fungus and bacterias. And while it's not gonna make you sick if they make whiskey out of that grain, it probably won't taste on profile. And so they test the grain first. Then they pump it into these grain silos where it waits for the magical day that it's gonna go and get ground up so it could turn into its purpose, which is to be bourbon for you. So let's go check out what happens after it leaves the grain silos. So now that you've got grain at the distillery and it's in the silo, you're gonna have to move it around the distillery, right? And that can be a little bit difficult because it's not like pumping a liquid around. So they have this really ingenious system where they set up tubes like this one that's behind me. And inside the tube is a chain that has plates on it. So the gravity will push the grain down into the chain system and there's a section that the grain can fit in between the different discs. Those discs are pulled along by the chain until they get the grain to where it needs to be. And the first place that the grain has to go is to the mill. So let's go check out the mill. All right, so now we've got grain and we have a transportation method to move the grain around. Now, before they start a cook, they have to decide what the mash bill is going to be. And a mash bill is just simply the combination of grains that's going to go into the bourbon. As we've already discussed, 51% has to be corn, but typically you're gonna be somewhere around 70 to 80% corn for most bourbon mash bills. And they are going to put in an order for the movement system to pull a certain poundage, a certain quantity of grain. And that's gonna come in right here at the top of this hammer mill. Now, for bourbon, the grain particles stay with the distillate all the way through the process of going through the, the cooker, through the fermenter, and through the still, which is a little bit different than malt-based grains. Most malt-based grains don't have the grain going along through the process. Now, we are very concerned with bourbon about surface area because we want to make sure that we can extract the maximum amount of flavor and sugar out of these grains, which means we're going to have to grind the grain up into a very fine powder. And to do that, most distilleries use a hammer mill like the one that we see here. So a hammer wheel works almost exactly the way a garbage disposal works. You have a entry point. In this case, it comes down from the top after it's been weighed, and it drops into this chamber. And the chamber has a circular uh, metal piece that goes around it that has holes in it that are designed to keep particles of the grain from coming out of the grinding process before they've been pounded into a small enough particulate. So it kind of sifts the grain and makes sure that only the smallest particles can go through. And I say that it works like a, like a garbage disposal because if you've ever looked down in your garbage disposal, there's these metal pieces that spin around as the centerpiece spins. And that's how a hammer mill works. You've got these, these metal things that stick out and as you can see, they, they can move about as, as it spins. So the centerpiece spins, these things sling around, the grain falls into the top of it, it gets bashed by all of those hammers, and then as the particulate gets small enough, it will fall down through the sieve and down onto the chain auger that will pull it over to where it needs to go for the next process, which is to get put into the cooker. 
All right, so after we have a very fine powder that we call grist, we're gonna move that over into the grist case where it is going to wait to be mixed with hot water. So behind me, we have the hot liquid tanks and all of this is used to heat up equipment. It's used to put hot water into the cooking tank. And the next thing that's gonna happen with that material is it's gonna get mixed with water in the cereal cooker. Now the cereal cooker is very important because yeast are going to later eat all the sugar that's in this slurry and turn it into the sweet, sweet ethanol that we wanna drink. But before the, the yeast can get access to the sugar, we have to break down all of those complex carbohydrates. And that's why we have to have heat. That's why we have to grind the grain to such a fine powder. And that's why we have to have sun enzyme that's gonna be in that substance that's gonna break that sugar down. So let's go check out what the cereal cooker looks like. Now we are going to check out the cereal cooker. So all of that grain that we saw moved around and the water that was coming from the HLTs gets pumped into the cereal cooker, which basically works like a giant KitchenAid, except that there's a wand in the center that has boiling hot steam going through it so that they can regulate the temperature. They put all of that slurry in here and they're gonna heat it up for about three to four hours. And there are enzymes that are in malted barley that actually there's, there's way more enzyme than is necessary to break down the complex carbohydrates that are inside the malted barley. And so there's a bunch extra that gets to work on the complex carbohydrates that would be in the corn or the rye or the wheat or whatever the other grains are that happen to be in that bourbon mash bill. And it can, along with the heat, break down all those complex sugars into the small sugars that the yeast want to eat later. Uh, but there are some distilleries that still pitch in a little bit of an enzyme and they don't get all of the enzyme from the, the malted barley. And anytime that you see a distillery that has, for instance, 100% corn bourbon, they have to use some sort of an enzyme because they're not getting it from the malted barley. But all of that goes in here and gets cooked and that is the preparation process for it to head over to the fermenter where the yeast get to work making the ethanol that we're hoping to drink at the end of this process. Sorry, Bourbon Real Talk listener. Randy Sullivan coming in for a quick shameless merch plug. If you want to support this channel, you can do so. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. We do not have a Patreon like some of my counterparts, no disrespect, but I don't like to ask you guys directly for money. And I also don't allow any sponsors of the show because I want to be independent to share my opinion with you without anybody putting any pressure on me. So if you would like to get some merch, here's some of the things we have to offer. We have bourbon real talk lanyards. So if you check this out, if you've ever been to a bottle share before, you need to communicate with people, shake hands, do whatever, pick up another bottle, get another pour, this thing is clutch. Secondly, we have the bourbon real talk official Glen glass. This is a tulip shaped glass that's going to help you nose and really enjoy the characteristics of your whiskey. Next up, we have the Wee tasting glass. So, this is roughly half the size of a full size glass. This is something very special because on the market, there were only two sizes of this glass, and we created a third because my wife, Lindsay, check out episode 100 is an amazing person who can source things and make things come out of nowhere. If you ever go to a tasting and you want to be able to sample a lot of things, but you don't want to drink too much whiskey, you need one of these smaller glasses. Now, a lot of people think candles are just for women, but that's not true. Men like good smells too. And we've produced a line of masculine smelling candles for anybody out there that's interested in that. We've got leather and charcoal and tonka for you guys. Now, as you get more involved in the whiskey collecting game, you're gonna make friends and you guys are gonna trade samples and you need a beautiful solid wood storage case to keep them in because otherwise they're just gonna clutter up your shelves. We have two sizes, one for one ounce sample bottles and one for two ounce sample bottles. But if you really wanna step your whiskey game up, what you need is an American Whiskey Aroma Kit Bourbon Real Talk official. This has 36 separate scents inside of it that are gonna help you develop your whiskey palette. You can sit down with a dram, break it down to its components, take your whiskey review level to the next step. This kit is used at two major Kentucky distilleries I can't disclose, 
but one of them has confirmed that they use this to train their sensory team. So if you want to take your whiskey game to the next level, you need to pick up one of these American Whiskey Aroma Kits. But if you didn't see anything that you liked here, that's fine. It's okay. We're just glad to educate you. We love to have you as a listener. So after we get done cooking the mash and we've released all of those sweet, sweet sugars, we have to move that slurry over into a fermentation tank and add yeast so that it can create ethanol. Now, there's a lot of variance here depending on the distillery and how they wanna do this with their bourbon. There's two main processes. One process is called a sweet mash and a sweet mash is gonna be a shorter fermentation time and that's going to keep the pH from getting a little bit too high. And there are some benefits to that. You're gonna get a sweeter, more grain forward tasting bourbon out of that process. But the drawback is, is that it's not in there long enough to develop some of the more complex esters that'll give you your fruit flavors, right? Uh, there's also another thing that you can do to affect pH and that's to lengthen out your fermentation times. So in Kentucky, where most bourbon is made, you'll find that the fermentation times are about two and a half to three and a half days, and they just kind of monitor the levels because they want to make sure that they fully used up that mash and that they get all of the sugar converted into ethanol so that they can distill that out later. But the, there's another process that they use called a sour mash where after that fermented grain, and remember all the solids are in it in bourbon, go all the way through the process and come out of the still on the other side, you have what's called spent mash. It's, it's already used up, there's no sugar left in it. And they will take that and it's called setback. And they will set that back and add water to it and leave it sit in a tank for a few days where it gets exposed to all kinds of things in the ambient air and the pH changes and then they're going to use that as setback and put it into the next fermentation system and that's what's called a sour mash process so you've got sweet mash which is shorter you have no setback you're keeping the 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 ph low you've got sour mash which is um, a little bit longer you let the fermentation or you you let the ph levels go high during the fermentation and then there's kind of a hybrid model that's technically a sweet mash because you're not adding any setback into the fermentation but you leave it in the fermenter for a lot longer period of time something like seven days maybe as long as nine days and you get the full spectrum of pH and that allows a lot of complex esters things like butyric acid that later turns into uh, isobutyl acetate that tastes like pineapples or you'll get um, you can have different fermentation temperatures that will produce different esters like isoamyl acetate that tastes like bananas or you know if you do it a little bit shorter you don't have as much time you might get some apple flavors and some lighter flavors like that but you're not going to get the heavier you know stone fruits pineapples peaches things like that and so this is the fermentation tank now when they put it in there and they pitch the yeast and you look at it it looks as if they're boiling it but they're actually not boiling it that is co2 that's being released by the yeast as they consume the sugars because the the, the yeast will eat the sugars and they produce co2 and they produce ethanol that's the, the byproduct of their food. And so when you look into a fermentation tank, one, most fermentation tanks are open air. Now here at Balcones, they look like they're closed systems, but they're not. Um, these actually do get ambient air into them. It allows wild yeast cultures to get in there and to produce different flavors and all that stuff. And that makes some people nervous because they're worried that they could consume the whiskey and take something in that's not good for their body. But remember, this, this slurry has not gone through the distillation process yet. And distillation is purification. And so anything that's in here that you're not supposed to have in your body is gonna get stripped out by that distillation process. So you can have open air fermenting tanks like they have in, in Kentucky. You can have these that look like they have a closed top, but there's actually air getting in there. And when you watch it go through its process, when they first put the yeast in there and the yeast get to eating, right? It looks like it's boiling like crazy. But as the yeast eat all of the sugar and they're producing less CO2 because there's less sugar for them to eat, the boiling of that tends to calm down and get lower and lower until it's almost completely still. And that's when the distillery knows that that fermentation is done and it's ready to be sent over so that it can go through the distillation process. So one of the most crucial elements to bourbon 
is distillation. So there are some regulations associated with bourbon, and one of those regulations is you're gonna take your fermented distiller's beer and you're going to put it into a still. But there's no requirement for it to be a particular type of still. It could be a pot still, like, Balcone, like Balcones uses. It could be a hybrid still, which is something between a pot still and a column still. And it could be a column still. Now column stills are different because the distiller's beer gets pumped into the top of the still and there's heat at the bottom. So as it goes down the column, there are plates and those plates separate temperature zones and the heat coming up will cause different compounds inside that distiller's beer to evaporate and become a vapor and float up and down in that column until everything is properly separated. And the stuff that comes all the way down to the bottom is completely spent mash and you know that's gonna probably go out to a feedlot or become the setback that they put in the next batch of fermentation. But in a pot still, they're gonna pump the distiller's beer into the bottom. The heat source is usually at the bottom and it will start to evaporate and those vapors will come up. And the first things that evaporate are the lighter compounds, which are called the heads. And the heads have like acetate and acetone and things like that in them, things that you wouldn't wanna drink. And when you hear that moonshine will make you go blind, it's not that moonshine makes you go blind, it's that moonshiners are historically alcoholics. And when they would fire their stills up, they would be thirsty and they'd drink the first thing that came off the still. And that's not actually ethanol. And so if you drink just the heads, it can become dangerous, it can cause macular degeneration, that can cause blindness. Um, but the middle part of the distillation run on a pot still is called the hearts. And that's the ethanol and that's what we want to collect. And the last part is what we call the tails, and those are some heavier compounds. Um, there's a lot of esters and oils and things like that in there. And so where I'm standing, you can kind of see the command center for the Balcones pot stills. Now most, uh, if not all bourbons, are distilled at least twice. And that's because for the most part, the first time that you run the distiller's beer through the process, what comes off is going to be considered the low wines. And then you take the low wines and you ferment that a second time. And what comes off the still is a much higher ABV and that is considered the high wines. The high wines are typically for a Kentucky bourbon somewhere between 135 and 145 proof. Different craft distilleries will you know, distill at different proof points. Uh, but if you're gonna make a bourbon, it can't be above 160 proof. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is we've already added water to the process once, and that's when we were going into the cookers. And we had to add hot water so that we could break down those sugars. Whenever you get your, your distillate off of your still and you have your high wines, usually it's too high of a proof to be put into a barrel and call it bourbon. Bourbon cannot be put into the barrel above 125 proof and distilleries will decide what proof they want to put their, their distillate in the barrel at. Some are as low as 110, uh, like at Wild Turkey, Russell's Reserve goes in at 110, but a lot of distilleries go at 125. It's a more efficient way to age your bourbon, but it may not produce the greatest flavor. But because you're coming off of the still at a higher proof, you're going to have to add some water to it. And that water is going to be a neutral reverse osmosis water or a distilled water or something that has no flavor compounds in it because at that point you're just trying to proof it down. And then you are going to take that distillate and you're gonna put it into the barrel for the maturation process. So let's go over and check out the barrels and see what that's all about. So the still is awesome, but the still doesn't do all the work in one go. So what happens? Well. Distillation is purification, and it's about separating things based on their boiling points. And there's, as we discussed, there's two main types of stills. You've got your pot stills, right, which run in sessions, and you have your column stills, which they run continuously. Um, and when you have your column still distillation, you have your head, your heart, and your tail, and the heads end up venting off into the atmosphere and the tails end up in the spent mash that usually gets dried out and sent out to some sort of a feedlot. But when you're distilling bourbon with the pot still, 
you actually end up with head cuts and heart cuts and tails cuts. And if you're doing it kind of the Scottish way, they'll sometimes put the heads and the tails together and they call that the feints. And what's behind me is a, a tank that's filled with the hearts. On the opposite side of the camera is a tank that's filled with the heads and the tails. And most distilleries, because they're trying to maximize the extraction of the ethanol from all of their fermentation runs, is they will usually redistill that. So they'll put that back in. So on a column still, they'll pump the the anything that came off in the doubler, they'll pump that back in and they'll try to purify that. But here at Balcones, they get to separate those things because they operate in sessions on the pot still, and you'll have your ethanol and then you'll have your heads and your tails put together the feints. And it's just a, a, an amazing way for you to get more yield out of every run that you do. Uh, but the way that you handle that also affects the flavor of your whiskey. Because in the tails are some heavier compounds, some oils, um, some ester compounds that can actually add flavor to the bourbon in the long run. Um, and some of those compounds, they smell and taste terrible when they first come off of the still. Um, like uh, butyric acid smells kind of like a, a hot dumpster. But if you leave it to esterify and it turns into isobutyl acetate, then you will end up with something that tastes like pineapple. And so the, the cuts are super important when you're dealing with a pot still bourbon and on the column stills, it's not as important since it's continuously run and it produces a cleaner spirit. So after we come off the still, we're going to typically be proofed down. Now, we gotta go into the barrel no more than 125 proof to be bourbon. Those are the rules. And it has to go into a barrel that has never had anything in it before, what we call first use. Okay, so it's a first use barrel. And the regulations state that it has to be a new charred oak container, not a barrel. A container but because if you don't make it into a barrel you're probably gonna have to have some metal fasteners in some way and bourbon reacts very poorly when exposed to any sort of a metal and you can put a barrel together without having any fasteners virtually all whiskey is stored in barrels um, there is no time that it has to be stored in a barrel for it to be bourbon you could literally pour it in the barrel and immediately pour it out. The barrel has had virtually zero impact on that whiskey and it is legally bourbon, just so long as it is a new charred oak barrel. And charring is exactly what you would think. It is burning the inside of the barrel and it creates a charcoal layer on the inside of the barrel. And as barometric pressure changes and temperature changes throughout the seasons, the pressure inside that barrel will change and it will push the whiskey in and out of the wood. If you were to take one of these staves out of this barrel and cut it in half and look at a, a cross section, you would see what they call the red line. And that is the depth in which the whiskey penetrated into that wood. And the interesting thing about what we call maturation, the, the barrel aging process, is that it actually imparts a good bit of the flavor that we taste in whiskey because oak does have some wood sugars and the charring process will caramelize those wood sugar flavors and make a caramel flavor. But oak also has a compound in it called vanillin, which is what gives vanilla the flavor that it has. And so that's why oak will always impart, especially a new oak barrel will always impart a vanilla flavor and a caramel or a toffee you know, some sort of caramelized wood sugar flavor into a bourbon. And they're going to put that bourbon into the barrel and they are going to age it until it reaches what they consider maturity. And each brand has its own expectation for what that whiskey is supposed to taste like. And there are some brands that traditionally have to be aged for a very long time to reach that flavor profile that they're looking for. And there are other brands that are shorter. The maturation process, as we mentioned, for it to legally be bourbon, it doesn't have to be in there for any particular amount of time, it just has to be new. 
But if you want to call it a straight bourbon, it must be in for two years. But if it is in the barrel for less than four years, the whiskey must have an age statement on it, bourbon or otherwise in the United States. So if you want to make a straight bourbon and it is less than four years old, it has to be between two and four years old, and then you have to state how old it is. The other designation that bourbon can have would be a bottled and bond, and all bottled and bond bourbons are at least four years old. But the whiskey is going to be put into a new charred oak barrel like the ones that are behind me, and it is going to be aged to that brand's perfection, and then it is going to be taken over to the uh, lab to be analyzed to determine whether or not that barrel is ready to be pulled from its aging process, and it will go into the blending process at that point, and they will decide what barrels are going to be dumped together that are gonna produce the flavor profile that represents that release and that brand of whiskey before we head over to the chill filtration and the proofing portion of the process. So here we are in the blending room and this is kind of where the magic happens. There's two types of blending that can happen. One blending is where you're shooting for something that tastes good to you. Um, that's pretty easy to do because if you get good barrels and you blend them together, you're not gonna end up with something that tastes terrible. But as you can see, we got a pretty complicated setup in this room. And that's because this is the other type of blending. And that's when you are blending barrels together to match up with the flavor profile for that particular brand of whiskey. And that requires a whole lot of science, a whole lot of art, and a little bit of luck because blending is magical. So all of the barrels have to be cataloged. So there's typically a tasting team that works at each distillery and most people have other jobs. It's not just their job to taste the barrels if you were thinking about quitting your job and working your way into a new career. They have to do other things at the distillery, but they have trained their palates to be able to identify the characteristics that are for the particular brands that they release. And so those people will catalog all of these barrels, taste them, and make notes and usually there's a panel that decides when a barrel gets pulled from the maturation process and then you will blend uh, individual barrels together to try to come up with a product that tastes like your last release so that consumers can learn to rely on that particular brand. They know they're gonna get something that has a flavor that's familiar to them. And so how you do that is a little bit uh, of a mystery to me. One day I'll do a podcast piece on that. Um, you know, but you hear stories about, you know, they've got a blend and they've done all the stuff that they normally do and it's not quite right. And they go, oh my God, you need to go get barrel, you know, 1720 out of such and such warehouse. You throw that barrel into this blend and then boom, we're gonna have something that's perfect. And so just understand that part of the process, and there's a difference between a single barrel and a regular batched product. Uh, the word blend means something different in Scotland than it does here in the United States. Um, and then there's the term blended whiskey, which means something entirely different. And there's other podcasts for that. But when I use the term blend in this sensory lab and in this blending room, I'm talking about the marrying together of barrels so that when you have a release, it produces the volume of whiskey that you would want for one of your releases. And you, you know, hats off to all of those master blenders that are out there because they are the ones that are creating a, cons a consistent whiskey experience for you, the drinker. So after maturation, you gotta get the whiskey out of the barrel. And every distillery has some sort of a contraption to either dump the barrel or to siphon the whiskey out of the barrel. At Balconies, they use a dump trough. And the cool thing about a dump trough is it's got these hydraulic lifts that'll pick up the barrels, because barrels, when they're 100% full, are pretty heavy. They weigh around 800 pounds. Uh, so they'll, they'll roll it up here. They take out the bung plug that plugs up the bung hole 
no cornholio jokes, and they'll roll the barrel until the bung hole is on the bottom and they allow gravity to push all of the whiskey out and it's going through this screen here. And the interesting thing about barrels is since they're charred on the inside, they have flakes of charcoal that break off on the inside of the barrel as the barrel is aging. And a lot of that comes off in the dump trough is char. And this stuff can be used as compost. It can be used to smoke, you know, meats if you're into smoking meats. There's a lot of secondary uses for this, uh, but they have to filter that out because they don't want that in the bottle. Now, I have had some whiskeys and some bourbons that were, bo that were bottled with char in them, and it can impart a little bit of a bitter flavor because there's still some tannic acid in, that, in, in those chunks of, of oak. And so most distillers will get it out. So they're gonna dump the barrel on the dump trough. They're like MGPI, for instance, when they do their bourbons, they siphon out and they have a pump that works super efficiently. And it uh, causes them to be able to leave more of the char in the barrel and not have all of that come out. But somewhere or another, they get the, the, the whiskey out of the barrel. And then at that point, depending on what the ultimate proof of the whiskey is going to be, they may chill filter the whiskey. Now chill filtration is something that's kind of become a hot topic. And the basic concept is, have you ever put taco meat in a refrigerator and then came back the next day to fix yourself a taco? It's got that orange oil slick that's on the top of the meat. Well, that's because there were some fats that at temperature were in liquid form, but when they cooled down, they solidified and became solids. Well, the same thing can happen in whiskey, only it happens at much lower temperatures for the most part. So depending on the alcohol level of a bourbon that they're gonna bottle it at, they may have to, and, and, and there's different schools of thought. I've heard everything from 86 proof all the way up to 95.8 proof. But somewhere in that range, a whiskey becomes at risk of the oils that are inside the whiskey congealing and making the whiskey go cloudy in colder environments. And to prevent that cosmetic issue from happening, distilleries developed a practice called chill filtration, where they will chill the whiskey down to a super cold temperature, cause all of those fats to congeal, and then they run it through a filter. And theoretically, this is only a cosmetic treatment, but there are a lot of people that believe that that oil being left in the whiskey will affect the length of the finish because it's holding those flavor molecules onto your palate for a longer period of time. And I personally have experienced that super oily whiskeys will sometimes give me heartburn if they're high proof. And I'm wondering whether or not that's the oil holding that ethanol up against my esophagus and causing that burning. So they got to decide, are we going to chill filter the whiskey or is it going to be a non-chill filtered whiskey? But once they're done with that process, it's going to go into a proofing tank, which is just over here to my left. They're going to pump all of that filtered or non-filtered barrel proof whiskey into a proofing tank and they are going to add water to it. Yes, your whiskey for the most part has water added to it before they put it in the bottle. And that's why they're able to tell you the exact proof that it's at because as we discussed during maturation, the proof can sometimes go up, it can go down, but it very rarely lands on the exact number that that product is designed to be bottled at. And for that reason, they have to add water to it to proof it down. Now, one of the things that they'll tell you when you go to Kentucky for tours is that they're using Kentucky limestone filtered water. And that is kind of true. It's not as true as it used to be. All of the major legacy distilleries are now on municipal water, but the municipal water arguably did go through the limestone filtering plate before it was pumped from some aquifer somewhere and put into the municipal water supply system. But when you're proofing whiskey, like we're seeing over here in these proofing tanks, you're not using whiskey that has any minerals or anything like that in it, in it. You're using some reverse osmosis water that doesn't have any uh, minerals or particles in it that could impart flavor because at that point, the whiskey is finished. They are no longer trying to affect its flavor. All they're trying to do is change its proof. And that has to take place before we move over to bottling. So after you've proofed your whiskey down, you have to put it in a bottle so that you can get it out to a consumer. It didn't always used to be that way. There was a time pre-prohibition where a lot of producers would sell whiskeys by the barrel to pharmacies and places like that, and then you would bring your bottles and you would fill them up. 
But after prohibition, as a consumer protection provision, distilleries were no longer allowed to sell bourbon in any container size in the United States above 1.75 liters. And so you got to get your whiskey into a bottle after you've filtered it, if you're going to filter it, and after you have proofed it down, if you're going to proof it down. And behind me is a bottling line. And basically the way that it works is the bigger the distillery, the more automated their bottling line is. Because if you think about it, you have to have an empty bottle. It's got to be loaded onto the system. You have to have some system that gets the whiskey into the bottle. You have to have a system to get the label on the bottle, the cork in the bottle, a tamper uh, strip on the bottle, and you have to have the little plastic that vacuum seals or something if it's a foil top. Um, there's heating devices that can be involved in it. And here at Balcones, they have a pretty automated system, as you can see. It's a long bottling line, but I've been to smaller bourbon producers that do a lot of this stuff by hand. I've seen distilleries that do all of their labels applied to the bottles by hand, and you can get pretty good at it. Uh, but it is obviously a crucial component in getting that whiskey out to you, the consumer. So if you didn't know how bourbon was made, that is how bourbon is made. I hope that you enjoyed this little segment that I put together for all of you guys. If you're unfamiliar with the channel, let me say that Bourbon Real Talk is built to be a very welcoming place. Our goal is to bring as many people into the bourbon space as possible. And the reason why that's our goal is because I have discovered that bourbon has a special, unique connective power. Bourbon, for whatever reason, brings people together. And it's gonna get a little bit sad for a second, but I need to let you know why I'm doing all of this. And I will let you know that in 2014, I lost a loved one to suicide. And as you could imagine, um, you know, he, he had problems and we knew he had problems, but we didn't think that that's where he was in his headspace. And that came as a real shock to me and to my family. And after experiencing that, traumatic event, I, I wanted to find a way to try to, you know, help people that were hurting or alone to feel like they were connected so that they didn't have to feel alone, so that they knew that there was somebody that they could go to if they were experiencing difficulties. And since I saw bourbon bringing so many people together in the whiskey community, I thought, hey, what if I got involved? What if I, you know, started a whiskey club? What if I started a podcast? And I help people get to, connected to bourbon so that bourbon could help them get connected to others. And then everybody would know that they weren't alone and everybody would know that there were people around them that cared about them. And so that's part of the impetus of this channel is to use the connective power of bourbon to bring people together. But I also noticed that when I was around bourbon people, there weren't really any prejudices, if you will. Like it didn't matter what, your sexual orientation or religion or political beliefs or race or anything else was, we were just all enjoying a beautiful spirit together. And I saw that it was bringing people together. And I had started seeing people online that would see somebody that was from a different, I don't know, ideology, if you will, and they would be very hateful to each other online. But I wasn't seeing that in the bourbon world. And so I thought, this might be a good way to bring people together that have diverse opinions. Uh, because I, at one time, kind of lived in a bubble. And as I started to bring people into my life that had different opinions, we didn't always agree, but we could always share a drink together, walk away as friends, and it made my life fuller and richer. And so I want that for people. And the way I see it, if somebody can hate a stranger that they've never met online, it's just as easy for me to love that person. And because of our philosophy of helping people feel loved and connected, I end every podcast with the same sign off, and that's this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Say something again, you say. Well, I say something pretty much all the time. It's like I
I never stop talking, drives my wife crazy. My wife, she's gonna play on her phone. She's gonna sit over there, not paying any attention. But I gotta carry a phone for some reason because she's got pants on that look like hammer pants. But if a woman has pockets, she's gonna show you those damn pockets. They're very excited about pockets. It's hotter than balls in here, people. Just the right amount of glistening. I'm in here suffering for you, okay? Because I'm trying to bring you the good content. That's what I care about, okay? Care about my people being educated.